Uh, good morning, good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Ivan, and I will be uh, presenting this webinar for you today. Um, so our webinar uh, topic today is uh, Methods of Viscosity Measurement, a Historical Overview. Um, now, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the uh, kind of basic uh, viscosity measurement methods and uh, kind of give a brief history of these methods and of uh, the concept of viscosity measurements in general. Now, what's interesting about viscosity is that the formal introduction of the term viscosity really only occurred in the early 20th century. But at the same time, the concept of a fluid having a thickness or a thinness, this concept has existed for thousands of years. Uh, it's simple enough to observe just, you know, uh, by looking at a fluid uh, or by feeling a fluid or by drinking a fluid, very simple to observe that different fluids have different viscosity or different thickness. Um, dating back even thousands of years, uh, people have have at least a basic concept of thickness. Uh, for example, uh, water clocks in ancient Egypt and China uh, were found to require uh, warming in the wintertime to remain accurate uh, due to changes in the viscosity of the water. Uh, curiously enough, um, recently we found that not only can you feel viscosity changes and see viscosity changes uh, and taste viscosity changes, you can even hear viscosity changes uh, by comparing the sound of pouring cold water to hot water. Now, the simplest way of determining changes in viscosity is, of course, by pouring a fluid and timing uh, how long it takes to empty or fill a vessel. The higher the viscosity, the slower the liquid will flow. And you can see uh, in this uh, uh, animation on the right, uh, the low viscosity fluid pours quickly and readily, whereas the high viscosity fluid pours much more slowly. Now, these ancient uh, methods of viscosity determination, uh, so there are historical references to uh, pouring fluids and observing um, differences in their behavior. Uh, these ancient methods of determination would be most similar to what we today call a funnel-type viscometer. Uh, so we, in the funnel-type viscometer, the time it takes for a set amount of fluid to fully pass through a funnel is measured and is compared to the time it takes for a reference fluid. Uh, this, in turn, is used to determine a viscosity index value or apparent viscosity. Uh, this method has a few limitations, of course. It requires large sample volumes and is only accurate for simple, uh, sufficiently viscous Newtonian fluids. Uh, but it is a very simple method. As you can see here, uh, you need a funnel, a pitcher, and a stopwatch. Uh, and that's all you need for this measurement. Now, the most uh, well-known funnel type viscometer is known as the Seibolt viscometer. Uh, this viscometer was named after the uh, brothers who invented it, uh, George and Edward Seibold of the late 19th to early 20th century. Uh, it is, uh, there are two other uh, similar viscometers you may have heard of, the Ford vis viscosity cup and Zahn viscosity cup, which operate on some somewhat similar principles. Um, the Seibold viscometer is essentially a funnel type viscometer that operates at controlled temperatures. So as you can see in the image on the right, you have a funnel, uh, which is surrounded by a temperature control bath, and you have a uh, 60 uh, milliliter beaker underneath it uh, to collect your fluid. Um, now, this uh, viscometer uh, generates data in units of stable universal seconds, uh, typically uh, represented as SUS. These units can be converted to centistokes at 37.8 Celsius, although the conversion is a little bit tricky. Uh, there's actually several different formulas depending on how high the SUS number is exactly. Uh, so for easy reference, uh, we just put together a chart of a couple of different uh, uh, points. Uh, 
an interesting little note is that uh, SAE, SAE numbers for oil, uh, you may know them as the um, oil grade uh, or the uh, numbers written on a bottle of engine oil that denote its uh, grade. Uh, these numbers are actually based on uh, sable viscosity originally uh, because this method used to be quite popular among the petroleum industry. Now you'll know um, that by going from uh, ancient uh, times to uh, sable viscometers, uh, I jumped straight from the era of Greek philosophers and before beyond uh, straight to the 20th century uh, using the term viscosity that was only even introduced in 1929. Uh, so the question is how did the concept of viscosity develop in between? Well, for a long time it didn't. Um, that's, that's a bit of a simplification. Uh, the underpinnings, the, the concepts upon which viscosity would be based on, viscosity measurement would be based on. These have developed over the last two millennia, um, dating as far back as uh, uh, Greek times up to the uh, 16th and 17th century. Uh, these topics such as buoyancy and density, uh, uniformly accelerated motion and drag. Uh, now because viscosity measurement relies on these concepts in order to function, it's difficult to completely explain its history. As a result, we're only going to focus on the uh, major developments as far as uh, historical views go. One of the largest early developments uh, in the history of viscosity measurement was Newton's work on the conservation of momentum in 1687 uh, and then the concept of pressure uh, also started by Newton but later expanded upon by Pascal. Uh, Newton calls the viscosity uh, the lack of slipperiness of the parts of the fluid which uh, when you think about it is a, is a pretty accurate way of describing viscosity uh, maybe a little bit less uh, uh, efficiently phrased, <laughs> um, but still a very accurate uh, phrasing. Uh, Newton postulated on the idea that a fluid exhibiting a friction force uh, will have an effect on the shear stress of, um, of uh, the, the pipe or container that it's flowing through. Now, uh, several other important concepts tie into viscosity. Uh, one is the deformation and flow of materials. Um, this uh, concept was expanded upon with uh, Daniel Bernoulli uh, with the Bernoulli principle. And the Bernoulli principle states that in an incompressible flow, uh, incre increases in speed will correspond with decreases in pressure or potential energy. Uh, around the same time, uh, in 1757, uh, Leonard Euler, uh, who worked closely with Bernoulli, uh, developed his equations uh, governing inviscid flows, known as uh, Euler's equations, uh, which leads to a complete and modern statement of mass uh, conservation. Um, now, at the time of Euler's work, uh, no references to viscosity really existed yet, um, so his equations don't feature viscosity. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the earliest references to these uh, relations, uh, the relations of um, used in Euler's equations, date back to actually the second century AD, uh, but in a less complete form. Now, uh, as some of you may know, uh, the SI units of viscosity are Pascals, and these are named after uh, Pascal. Now, skipping forward a little bit, um, so we're gonna skip forward in time uh, as uh, at this stage, there was a lot of development um, in terms of uh, physical chemistry, physics, and fluid dynamics. Uh, so we'll only focus on the, uh, the, the big ones here, uh, the ones that are relevant to us. Um, in 1822, uh, Claude-Louis Navier and George Stokes published the Navier-Stokes equations, which I'm sure uh, you are all familiar with. Uh, these further expand upon Euler's equations and are a key underpinning of studies involving any sort of fluid behavior. In 1840, 
Uh, God help Heinrich Ludwig Hagen and Jean Leonard Marie Poiseau uh, published the Hagen Poiseau equation dictating the pressure drop of an incompressible Newtonian fluid in laminar flow, in laminar pipe flow. Sorry. Uh, a short while later, the Darcy Weisbach equation was put in its final form. Uh, the Darcy Weisbach equation relates the pressure loss due to friction to the average velocity of a fluid. Many more developments have occurred since then, but we're not going to focus on them right now. Instead, we're going to go ahead and talk about some viscometers. So after the uh, funnel or Seibolt type viscometer, uh, next most common type and one of the earliest this have developed was the glass capillary viscometer. Uh, these viscometers are known by many different names. Uh, they have glass capillary viscometers, YouTube viscometers, Ostwald viscometers, after Wilhelm Ostwald, um, major founder of physical chemistry and one of the developers, and uh, Uberhold uh, viscometers, after a, another uh, notable German chemist who also designed uh, a slightly different version of the glass capillary viscometer. Uh, the way a glass capillary uh, viscometer measures viscosity is very simple. Uh, essentially, um, Fluid is uh, pulled into the upper bulb of the uh, viscometer by suction, and uh, the suction is released, and the fluid is allowed to flow back into the lower bulb. The time it takes to move from one marking to the next, uh, in, in this image labeled C and D, is observed. This time is then used to calculate the kinematic viscosity, either by a manufacturer-provided equation or by comparison with a standard. Um, and you, you may have seen on the previous slide, the equation was simply uh, time times some particular constant is equal to kinematic viscosity. Now, these types of viscometers, again, um, they cannot uh, in any way control uh, shear rate, similar to funnel type viscometers, uh, but you don't have to use quite as much sample volume for these. Um, and they are easier to insert into a temperature. And next up, we have a uh, falling ball viscometers. These viscometers are patented in 1932 by Fritz Hoppler, uh, and they are the first to measure dynamic viscosity. Uh, the principle behind the falling ball viscometer is based on Stokes' law. Uh, essentially, a sphere of known weight and size is dropped into a fluid and is allowed to reach terminal velocity. The velocity, uh, the terminal velocity is measured, and from there, the friction force, Stokes drag, is calculated. Uh, once you have uh, Stokes drag, Stokes law uh, allows you to determine dynamic viscosity. And you can see in the equation on the right, the viscosity is related to the radius of the ball, uh, the gravitational constant, the density of the sphere and of the fluid, and the terminal velocity of the sphere. Now, all of these preceding viscometers have several similar disadvantages. They all rely on gravity-driven flow. This makes them easier to manufacture and produce, um, which, of course, explains why they, they were the original viscometers. Um, but it means that uh, they have several limitations. Um, it means that highly viscous samples will have long measurement times uh, to the point of being impractical to use. Um, in addition, uh, this means that shear rates cannot be controlled or changed. Now, for simple Newtonian fluids, this doesn't matter, uh, but it makes accurate characterization and comparison of non-Newtonian fluids impossible. And in some cases, uh, some non-Newtonian fluids will not be able to be measured at all, depending on their uh, low shear viscosity. So from there, uh, we have uh, several other uh, somewhat more modern viscometer types. Now, I say more modern, but these are actually developed all in a very short time span, if you look closely. Uh, so next up is the spindle type viscometer. Um, now, there are many ty different types of spindle type viscometers. Uh, some are known as cup and bob viscometers. Some are known as coet viscometers. Uh, they all operate on similar principles, but with different geometries uh, that are uh, give them certain small advantages or disadvantages. Now, mention of uh, rotational viscometers dates back to at least 1931. Um, 
these viscometers feature a uh, cylindrical element, uh, not necessarily a, a full cylinder, um, but typically a spindle or bob uh, suspended in a cup of fluid. Uh, this spindle is rotated inside the fluid by a motor, and the torque required to rotate the spindle at certain speed is measured, whether it be by uh, a simple stepper motor uh, in a spring, as in a, a calibrated spring, as in uh, the older units, or a digital um, uh, digital controller, as in modern units. Now, in this case, the uh, measurement uh, value would be torque, and you could relate this torque value to viscosity uh, by dividing it by the rotational speed, typically in RPM, and then multiplying it by some constant k that depends on the particular uh, spindle and geometry used. Um, now, because there's a lot of different spindle type viscometers, this can vary from one to another, this constant K. Uh, now, compared to uh, cone and plate viscometers, which we'll be discussing next, uh, spindle type viscometers, they typically require larger sample volumes, uh, but they have uh, significantly improved resolution for low viscosity fluids because they have larger surface areas. Next up, we have code and plate viscometers. Uh, these are similar in mechanism to spindle type viscometers in that you have a rotating element uh, on a, uh, in a fixed uh, volume of fluid. Um, instead of a cylindrical element, however, uh, these feature a conical element on the, placed on the surface of the fluid. Now, this particular design actually allows for accurate characterization of shear rates. Um, this makes uh, cone and plate viscometers uh, designed superior to spindle type viscometers for non-Newtonian fluids. This design also allows for a few other key features. Uh, such as smaller sample volumes in the spindle type um, and the, the, the previously mentioned shear rates, but it also has a few limitations. Um, it increases the complexity of the setup. You have to uh, set the gap, uh, so to speak. You have to insert the cone onto the, uh, into, the, into the fluid very carefully uh, to align, to achieve a, an ideal gap between cone and plate. Uh, in addition, uh, this uh, the scammer type is more sensitive to particulates and typically has a reduced resolution at lower viscosities due to uh, reductions in surface area. Now next up, we have uh, microfluidic viscometers. It's a combination of old principles and new technology. Uh, it utilizes uh, an old principle, uh, hagen poiseuille flow for incompressible fluids, and it utilizes a new technology, uh, which is the fabrication of uh, microfluidic devices and MEMS technology. Now, our uh, microfluidic viscometer, known as the VROC, was uh, introduced in 2008 with development starting as far back as 2004. Uh, now, the way these uh, microfluidic viscometers work is a fluid passes through the flow channel at a fixed flow rate. Uh, as it passes through this flow channel, it experiences a drop in pressure that is uh, dictated by the, this, the hagen poise equation. Uh, this drop in pressure is measured with multiple pressure sensors placed throughout the channel. Uh, this pressure drop is directly related to shear stress, which in turn can be simply used to calculate fluid viscosity. This technique allows for accurate determination of viscosity and control of shear rate. It allows for characterization of non-Newtonian samples small sample volume measurements, and a broad shear rate range. And you can see on the right, uh, the basic equations are there. Uh, the shear stress is correlated to the uh, change in pressure times a geometric constant. The uh, shear rate is correlated to the flow rate, again, times a geometric constant. And the viscosity is simply the shear stress divided by the shear rate. Now, there have been many other uh, viscometry methods uh, showing up recently. Uh, we're not going to cover all of them uh, simply uh, due to time constraints, uh, but uh, I do want to touch on a few of them briefly 
to give you guys a brief idea of uh, what sort of other methods are out there. Uh, there's a few other common methods. Uh, well, I'm sorry, not common methods. There's a, a few other methods that I'm going to um, make a quick example of. Uh, there's an oscillating piston viscometer, uh, which essentially has a piston oscillating in the sample test fluid. Uh, the travel time of the piston is analyzed in order to calculate the shear stress and from there the viscosity. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, another type of viscometer known as a Stabinger viscometer. Uh, this one is quite interesting. It is a modern, modified version of a Coet viscometer. Uh, now, to back up a second, a Coet viscometer is essentially, in principle, an inverted version of a standard spindle viscometer, where the uh, sample container rotates and the spindle is stationary. Now, the Stabinger viscometer is essentially a modified, modernized version of the Coet viscometer, uh, where the sample container rotates and the spindle is stationary, uh, and is used to measure the, the, the shear stress. Um, another example would be a bubble viscometer. A uh, bubble viscometer is very simple. Uh, it simply measures the rise time of bubbles in a low viscosity fluid, uh, and it measures the time in order to calculate the viscosity of the fluid. It is used a lot in production of uh, things like low viscosity paints, uh, where it can easily be integrated into production. All right, well, that uh, sums up my presentation for today. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed uh, it and learned something new about uh, the history of viscosity uh, measurement and, and viscosity as a concept as a whole, or about some new uh, viscometer instrument that you haven't heard of before. Um, now, uh, just uh, for those of you uh, 